Hello and welcome to the Natives Neuro Training Academy webinar series. You may have noticed, but if not, I would like to share with you that our Neuro Training Academy has a new look and feel to it. Our NTA platform has become more engaging as we continue to provide you, our members, with direct access to the best educational content in neurodiagnostic, neurocritical care, and neurosurgery all in one comprehensive location. So check us out at Neuro hyphen training dot academy. Today's webinar is entitled Quantitative ENG. I'm Dr. George Grudziak, Global Medical Education Manager, Neuropathways, and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I would like to share some meeting details. All of your lines are muted to manage background noise during the presentation. We will allow time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please type your questions into the question box on your screen. This meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date or our Neuro Training Academy website. Our speaker today is Dr. Sanjeev Nandetkar. With over 30 years of experience, Sanjeev is an award-winning author, editor and reviewer, researcher, instrument design engineer, teacher, and clinical expert in the EMG field. He has delivered lectures, workshops, and seminars in over 25 countries at universities, hospitals, and EMG conferences. As an editor, Sanjeev started the EMG on DVD educational series. In collaboration with other clinicians, he developed the motor unit number index, the MUNIX, along with multimotor unit analysis, MMA, and turns an amplitude TA methods available on NATIS EMG system. His primary research interest is in automatic analysis of EMG signals modeling EMG signals and technical aspects of EMG waveform. Sanjeev is currently a senior consultant here at Natives Medical. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Nandedkar. Sanjeev, please. Thank you, George. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. And thank you again for to Natives and Natives Training Academy for giving me the platform to offer the teaching material. Today we are going to talk about quantitative EMG analysis. I deliberately selected this topic because many people think, well, I don't do quantitative EMG. It's not necessary. I really don't know what it adds to my EMG practice. And I think that's what I call a mythology in our EMG world. Uh, quantitative EMG analysis is very important, very useful, because that's the foundation of the routine EMG studies that we perform on a daily basis. So let's start with needle EMG. That's going to be our main focus today. It has been used to study diseases of nerves and muscle. In primary nerve or neuron diseases, it allows us to track changes in the muscle in response to the nerve injury or motor neuron loss. Needle EMG allows us to study abnormalities of neuromuscular junction disorder, which are better investigated by using the technique of single fiber EMG, using jitter analysis, but that is also something we can do using concentric needles as described in a webinar by Professor Stolberg about a month ago. And then we can also use needle EMG to study primary muscle diseases. So these are the diagnostic applications of needle EMG. We can also use needle EMG to understand muscle contraction and movement disorders. And finally, needle EMG can be used for treatment purposes for guiding the needle in hemodenervation processes. So needle EMG has a lot broader scope I'm going to focus mainly on the diagnostic part. Now the EMG examination can be divided into stages. The first stage is usually called the insertional and spontaneous activity assessment. This is useful to assess the excitability and stability of nerve and muscle fiber membranes. This recording is done when the patient is at rest. Next, we ask the patient to contract the muscle a little bit, and we look at the so-called motor unit potential or the MUP waveforms. We look at amplitude, duration, waveform, stability. 
And this gives us information about the motor unit architecture, which is how many muscle fibers are there in the motor unit? What's the density of muscle fibers? What's the size of muscle fibers? More specifically, the variation in the fiber diameter. And finally, we ask the patient to give a stronger contraction, maximum force if possible. That's where the EMG signals from different motor units start overlapping. And that's why we call it interference pattern uh, because it indicates uh, activation of different motor units. It is also called the recruitment pattern. And this gives us information about the number of motor units that can be activated, as well as the so-called central drive or uh, which is uh, responsible for motor unit activation. So this is the kind of biologic or physiologic information that we are trying to get. And we do this in the routine EMG by observing the signals on a free running mode. We listen to the sound, that's the very important part. And by the way, today you may not hear the sound on some of the videos when I play the EMG signals, because I have reduced their intensity. Uh, I will be talking over the sound and uh, the two things don't mix pretty well. So if you don't hear the sound of the EMG, don't worry about it. The most uh, difficult part about routine needle EMG examination is that it is subjective. Uh, it depends upon your training, how many hours you have spent looking at uh, uh, observing the signals, the difficulty of patients, the kind of cases that you see. And it requires a certain amount of expertise and training in order to get better and better at needle EMG. In contrast, when we do quantitative EMG, we record the signals using standard conditions that may involve filters, the gain settings, and so forth. We make measurements. These can be done automatically, or sometimes they can be done subjectively. Sometimes we take automatic measurements and then maybe manipulate them a little bit uh, subjectively. And then we compare them with reference values. Note that I'm not using the term normal values because uh, when we say normal values, it is based upon a few uh, so-called presumed healthy subjects that we examine and come up with data. Uh, we like to use the term reference because these are general guidelines uh, that we like to use in our assessment. Quantitative EMG is objective because of these three conditions, standardized recording conditions, measurements, and comparison. And as a result, the findings that can be obtained on EMG analysis by an expert, as well as a study done by a novice, are more likely to be similar. And that's the benefit of quantitative EMG. Quantitative EMG started long, long time ago, uh, going back to Professor Bushthal in 1940s, when he started looking at motor net potential, amplitude, duration, phases, etc. Many people have done quantitative EMG studies, published papers, done research, and that's what has set up the ground rules for EMG interpretation that we used in routine analysis. When we are familiar with quantitative analysis, we can also listen to the signals easily. We can capture them easily. And when things appear complicated, difficult, mixed, we are not sure which way is the abnormality, knowledge of quantitative analysis can actually guide you on the right direction. So to me, that's the important thing for quantitative EMG. So in this webinar, I'm going to focus mainly on the recording techniques and measurement. I'm not going to go in details about how do you go about on interpreting each and every measurement. Uh, that's a completely different webinar. Maybe we can do it at some other time. But my focus is on recording technique and measurements. How do we capture signals? How can we make the measurements very quickly? For the illustrations and videos, I will be using two different systems. One is the Nicolay Synergy or Viking and the Dantec Keypoint. The features that I'm going to show you are common to both systems. The access to the features may differ slightly. So, I'm going to start off by asking you question number one. In a cooperative subject, in your estimation, how long will it take to make recordings for quantitative motor net potential analysis and interference pattern analysis. 
Okay, great. I'll launch this call and then we'll see. See what our audience thinks. Uh, also, to the audience, if you do not use full screen mode when answering these questions, it can prevent you from answering them. So do not use full screen mode. Okay, we're doing very well. Okay. Almost there. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And then I'll share the results. Here are the results. Oh, wow. Okay, so I'm very happy to see a lot of people selected a time of less than nine minutes. Uh, that's the answer I really would like to see. Very good. Actually, with practice and familiarity of software, it can be less than five minutes. Long time ago, uh, people, it used to take us about 30 to 40 minutes because we used to do all these procedures manually. But over time, the instrumentation has improved. You have got automated algorithms. You got the ability to save signals, review them. And as a result, the time is far less. But for some reason, there is a general perception that quantitative analysis is a very, very time consuming process. No, it is not. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, this to you uh, later. If you want to just document abnormalities, you know, I saw some abnormal potential. Well, you can do it with uh, quantitative analysis in just a minute or two. Anyway, we will address those issues. So going back to the EMG examination, uh, we start with the insertional activity analysis. So that's when we insert the needle, move it briskly, and then we are trying to see, is it normal or abnormal? In a normal subject, the activity stops within 200 to 300 milliseconds, which can be seen better on a slow moving trace seen at the top over here. So this is uh, one second per division, and you can see this burst lasted for 100 milliseconds, this one for about 200 to 300. We do not quantify it, we just subjectively say whether it is increased or reduced. But having a dual time base helps us to identify how long this activity lasted. So if it is less than 200 milliseconds, you know, we are very sure that this is normal. Again, this is subjectively increased or reduced. Then we look at spontaneous activity. The muscle is at rest. And the most common activity that we look for are the fibrillations and positive sharp waves. <coughs> now, this is an important measurement and it is quantified in two ways. One is a numerical scale, zero, one plus, two plus, et cetera. Notice that if you have abnormal spontaneous activity, fibrillations and positive sharp waves at one site, only one site, that is normal. That's an important distinction between one plus and having one site. One plus means that you need to have more than one site. Anything that happens just only once, one random observation, no matter how abnormal it is, we tend to downplay it. Uh, we do that in single fiber EMG also. That should be the practice. Something that is an outlier should not be overinterpreted. Another way is you can report the number of sites where you had increased spontaneous activity. So you may examine 10 sites, you insert the needle, go into three or four quadrants, and at each place you are looking at three sites. So you can easily reach about 10 sites, and you can say six out of 10 sites had abnormalities. And this is the kind of approach that is often uh, used in the, the technique of paraspinal mapping and so on. These are the activities that originate in the muscle. We can have activities that originate in the nerve or the motor neuron. So here is an example of the fasciculation potential. Again, an important part in our diagnostic workup for motor neuron disease. Once again, we do not quantify these waveforms, but some laboratories try to look at the rate, whether this is firing slowly or firing rapidly. Uh, it is not used in most laboratories, but nevertheless, that there are articles written about the firing rate of fasciculations in normal subjects versus those in pathology. There are other forms of activity that are noted. 
And again, we don't quantify them. As I indicated before, I like to use the dual time base, very useful to observe these waveforms because on the lower trace, I am looking at the waveform over here, which is part of motor unit potential analysis. I talked about measuring amplitude duration phases. And on the top slow trace, I can see the discharge pattern or the firing rate, which is related to the recruitment analysis. So those were the first two stages of needle EMG, insertional and spontaneous activity. So let's go to uh, some technical considerations uh, of these signals. But before that, I would like to ask you a question about what needle type do you generally use for your electrodiagnostic studies? Uh, natus concentric, natus monopolar, or perhaps you do not perform needle EMG examination or other brand of needle. Okay, so I, I, I misspoke. I, you have to be in full screen mode in order to answer these questions. So I, I, I'd like to clarify that. So here I'll launch the question and we'll have a response from the audience. <coughs> Doing very well. Okay, I will close the poll. And here we'll have the results. Oh, wow. Okay, so most of the people attending this are actually <clears throat> performing the needle EMG. Uh, that helps me to define the tone of presentation and so forth. It's really not related to the clinical part, uh, just to get a feel for who is listening. Okay, thank you so much. And so now, the reason I bring up about the electrodes is in quantitative analysis, the choice of electrode is important. The concentric needle is made of a hollow metal cylinder through which we pass a wire. It has 150 diameter um, wire and we grind the assembly to expose a cone shaped recording surface at the center. This is called the core or the active recording surface. The shaft of the needle serves as the reference electrode. So your active and reference electrodes are both built into a needle. And as a result, you tend to get less noise. You get better rejection of common mode signals. And this has been the needle that has been used extensively for quantitative analysis. Uh, most likely, if you see an article that describes uh, normal values, it is done using a concentric needle. <clears throat> Excuse me, Sanji. I, I think uh, yes. we're having some issues here where you can't see your slides. You see it. Okay. Uh, Put it back into presentation mode. Okay, let me go back and put it in presentation mode. One moment. Can you see it? No, I can't see it. Sanjeev, this is Mary. Are you in, um, if you click on sharing and then share your screen? Yep, that's what I'm going again. I'm sharing the screen. Oh, I there might you. have turned it off. Okay. Thank you. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Okay. I think I may have clicked the button accidentally when I was looking at the poll. Okay, so let me go back. Many apologies for that uh, little problem. Okay, so let's start again with the choice of electro. Uh, <clears throat> you can use a concentric needle, uh, which contains a metal hollow metal cylinder through which you pass a wire. It has a diameter of 150 microns, and you grind the assembly at a 15 degrees angle to expose this metallic surface. This is the core or the active recording surface, while the shaft of the needle serves as the reference electrode. And by having the active and reference electrodes close to each other, you get less noise in the recording. The concentric needle is used very extensively for the needle ear quantitative analysis. The needles are available in different sizes. What is important to remember is that 
we often like to use the thinner diameter needle, but it also has a smaller recording surface. And this can generally give you higher amplitude compared to the standard concentric. The standard concentric needle is uh, often called the green needle over here or the one with a blue uh, this symbol over here. This has a length of 37 millimeters. But anyway, these needles have a recording surface of 0.07 millimeters square. So keep in mind that you should be using standard needles when you are doing quantitative analysis. Monopolar needle is considered less painful, but I think again, that's one of the mythologies that was possibly true when we were using reusable electrodes. Now, I don't think there is any difference in the pain. It does require a separate reference electrode and therefore you can get more noise and interference. And you can reduce it by keeping the reference electrode close to the insertion site, but over an area that is silent during activation. And you can also use shuttle cables or longer leads to get noise-free recordings. There is an absence of reference values for monopolar needle uh, compared to the concentric needle. But as a ground rule, you can remember that the amplitude is about 20 to 50 percent higher compared to concentric. The duration of motonet potentials is similar. They give slightly more polyphasic waveforms. And this is something that I have said before. Although I like to use a concentric needle electrode, a good disposable monopolar is better than a bad reusable concentric. Okay, so that was my technical aspect discussion about needles because they are an important part of quantitative analysis. So now let's start with motor unit potential analysis. As I indicated, motor unit potential analysis gives us information about changes in the motor unit architecture. So on the left-hand side, I have shown schematically the cross-section of a normal motor unit. You can see there are many different fibers distributed in a roughly circular territory. Uh, there is very little variation in the fiber diameter. There is no tendency for clustering. Once in a while, we may find two fibers that are kind of close to each other, but by and large, they are well distributed. What happens, for example, in myopathy? We have loss of muscle fibers. So you can see there are areas over here where there is no muscle. So these muscle fibers are gone away. You have atrophy of muscle fibers. You can see this fiber became atrophic or this fiber became hypertrophic. So this leads to variation in fiber diameter. And you can have very hypertrophic muscle fibers that may actually split. So you can have these small clusters of muscle fibers that vary significantly in diameter. So you get a very patchy and uh, different distribution of muscle fibers within the same motor unit. And that's the reason you get different types of waveforms in myopathy. In neurogenic, you tend to be more similar, large amplitude, long duration polyphasic. In myopathy, it is much more tricky. And once again, quantitative analysis can be useful there. Anyway, so how do we do motor unit potential analysis? Well, we can do it in a very simplistic way. Just insert the needle, ask the patient to contract the muscle, and you look for sharp waveforms. When the waveforms are sharp, then you know you are very close to the muscle fibers. We can hear them. And on the machines, we can also have so-called quality monitor that will tell us the rise time. And then you freeze the waveforms. And when you freeze the waveforms, you can start looking for uh, motor unit potentials. And the rule is that the waveform must repeat. So here you can see waveform one. Over here, you can see it here. You can see it here. So that's one motor unit potential. It is another waveform, we see it repeating. So when you see the waveform repeating, you know this is coming from a single motor unit. So in this recording, we have three different motor unit potentials. We can make measurements and the amplitude is the simplest measurement. My gain is 200 microvolts per division. And this waveform is roughly two divisions tall. So that gives us an amplitude of 400 microvolts. Similarly, this motor unit potential is also 400. This one is just a little bit about 200. So that's quite easy. 
duration measurements can be difficult because you get baseline shifts, for example, over here or over here. But if you have a nice clean baseline before and after the motor net potential, duration can be estimated. We are at 10 milliseconds per division, or the total sweep is 100 milliseconds. And you can see this waveform is roughly one division. So that's about 10 milliseconds. And this one is about 10 milliseconds. This may be about five milliseconds or so. We can look at phases, which is how many times it changes the polarity. So this waveform goes down. So that's phase one, goes up, phase two, down, phase three. So this motor net potential has three phases. A simple way is to measure the number of zero crossings or the baseline crossing. Here I have crossing number one, crossing number two, and you add one to the measurement that gives you the number of phases. The waveform is described either as being simple or polyphasic. Polyphasic is when you have four or more, uh, four or more phases. Another quantification of the waveform is by looking at the number of turns, which is how many times does it change the direction? So this goes down, then it goes up, and that's it. So this has got only two turns. This may have three turns and so forth. So when you have more than five turns, that's considered abnormal, and we call such a waveform serrated. Another term that is used is complex waveforms. So that's a waveform which is either polyphasic or serrated or both. So these are the terminologies that are used in quantitative analysis. Now, just as an example, here are waveforms. This is how serrated or complex waveforms will look like. See, it has got so many phases, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But is that an abnormal motor net potential? No, because I don't see it repeating. Chance summation of many different normal potentials can produce long duration polyphasic waveforms. And that's one of the most common abnormalities or errors in EMG motor net potential waveform analysis. So keep in mind that you must look at waveforms that repeat. Anything that looks very complex but occurs only once, you ignore it. Another thing that we can do is show the waveforms in a uh, dual time-based mode. So you can see it over here. At the top, you can see the firing pattern of the motor units. And you can either show a single screen or you can raster multiple traces. Just freeze the waveform and look at the screen. And as soon as you freeze, you can see here is motor net potential one, here is motor net potential number two. You can see the amplitude is about 500 to 1000. They have simple waveforms and the duration looks okay. And you can move on. So it's just a matter of freezing the traces for just a second, looking at the screen, moving on. That's doing quantitative analysis in your routine EMG. That's what we call the uh, subjective and objective uh, interactive approach. Another thing we can do is use the so-called trigger. So this is where we set up an amplitude level. And this device has been available on EMG instrument for decades, but it's still not used. Now you can see waveforms of one motor net potential that are time locked. You have to adjust the trigger level so that only one waveform can cross it. And now you can superimpose the traces and you can easily see the duration. And now you can see the stability of the waveform. And so this can make it easier to assess complex potential. Triggering is very useful. Look at this recording. When we look at it in free run, that looks like a nice simple motor unit potential. But why don't we trigger on it? And all of a sudden, you notice that there is a linked potential. This is something that we would have missed if we were looking at the waveforms in a free running suite. And we can superimpose and see the stability of the waveform. So just a simple trick can give you significant amount of information. So we can take all of these principles we want to see a waveform that repeats. We want to be able to trigger on it so we can see the waveform clearly 
to assess duration and so forth. And that is what has led to the multi-map analysis. Whatever we do subjectively is something that would be done automatically using the computer. But that doesn't give you good quality. You have to put in good quality signals to get good quality results. So we have to record sharp EMG signals, manipulate the needle, have very slight activation, one to four different motor units. And collectively, I refer to this as the net firing rate in the EMG. And I like that to be a 30 hertz or less, at least in the algorithm that I use. Record for five to 10 seconds. Uh, you can get good results after five seconds, but my idea is that if you can hold it for another few seconds, you will get a lot of good clean discharges and perhaps it will reduce the time of uh, post acquisition editing. And then move on to the next site. I don't, the modern instruments will save the signals. There is not, it's not necessary to sit there and analyze the epoch immediately. In the interest of patient comfort, record a signal, move on to the next site, and then uh, repeat the process. So let me show you an example of multi motor unit analysis. You choose the program. Choose the muscle, ask for slight activation. That's a fantastic signal. I don't need 10 seconds. I could probably analyze it in two seconds. So I just accept it. You can see the waveforms in triggered mode. They are superimposed. Okay, that was too quick, even before I could finish my commentary. I move on to another site. Once again, notice the sharp potential. And here is my cumulative firing rate. I like to be under 30. If it goes more than 30, it gives me a warning over here. And I'm going to record about 10 seconds of EMG activity. Here is the analysis. Four different motor net potentials. As a review, you can see there are many waveforms superimposed, I'm sure. Maybe there is a late component over here that I didn't see in free running. Uh, post acquisition, we can clean up the signals, get rid of interference, so many things that can be done. But this is not necessary to do online. And nowadays, we can also look at the firing rate of motor net potentials also. Uh, we can see whether the measurements are normal or not, if we have normative data. So very easily, we can look at the waveforms. So in a proper quantitative motor net potential study, we record 20 or more motor net potentials. This requires three to four minutes. We investigate five to six different sites. We then offline, that's my preference, edit our motor net potentials. I like to reject noisy maps rather than trying to change parameters. So that's why I like to record 25 or 28 potentials and just get rid of something that is not nice. Again, it saves time and it is much more consistent. And we can do the analysis of mean amplitude, mean duration, and we can do it using all potentials or simple potentials. And we can also look at the outliers. Now, what I'm going to do is demonstrate to you that we can collect motor net potentials in a very short period of time. So here we go. I have started the quantitative EMG, selected the muscle, start recording the signal. Wonderful, I, don't need, I need only a second, I will analyze this. And you can see the waveform on the left, you can see it in a raster mode, you can keep it in superimposed, firing rate. Again, that's something that I do post acquisition. I change my needle site. There are two motor net potentials over here by visual assessment. I analyze it, it gave me only one, that's fine. Sometimes the computer is going to miss the waveforms. I change the site, I'm at site number three, I can see some complex waveforms. I'm going to stop recording, and you can see the complex potentials over here, the top left, site number four. And I'm changing my needle position by about five millimeters because that's the territory of the motor unit, a five to 10 millimeters. So if you move it minimally, you may be recording from the same motor unit over and over. I think I'm at site number six or so. Analyze this. 
And this time I am able to analyze five different potentials from this site. Maybe I do one more site. OK, so there are probably two motor unit potentials over here. One of them has a notch on the rising edge. OK, so that was a minute and 40 seconds. I have got 17 motor unit potentials. This is something that I just wanted to show you in real time. I really want to dispel the myth that quantitative analysis is time consuming. No, it is something that we can use in our routine daily practice. If there is a muscle that is important for diagnostic purposes, I think we should be using these techniques. This is an example of multimodalinate analysis in a normal muscle, 25 potentials. You can see the mean amplitude, duration, percentage of polyphasic. This is how it looks in myopathy. And as I indicated, you get a lot of variation in the signal. You can get high amplitude, very narrow potentials. You can get low amplitude potentials, something like this over here. You can get very complex waveforms. You can get link potentials. And that's what makes analysis challenging in myopathy. And in many laboratories, because the long duration polyphasic potentials can give you normal duration, the duration is calculated in two ways. The mean value using only the simple potential, like this waveform, this waveform, et cetera. Uh, and that gave me a duration of 7.3, versus using all of them gave me a much higher duration. And we look at the percentage of polyphasic potential. Here is a recording from neuropathy. It's a different calibration. So you can see the waveforms. And the duration is increased, and it's polyphasic. And in this case, we stop the examination after doing only eight potentials because there are so many clearly abnormal potentials or outlier potentials. Just to give you a little bit of uh, idea on what we are measuring, amplitude and area tell us about the density of fibers. If it is increased because of renovation, amplitude area goes up. You can also get high amplitude because of hypertrophy and that can happen in dystrophy or inclusion body myositis. And you can get reduced amplitude due to atrophy and loss of muscle fibers. Duration is most useful for differential diagnosis. It will be increased when there are more fibers in the motor unit because of reinnervation. It can also increase due to increased variability of fiber diameter, but this also makes the waveforms complex. Duration is reduced because of loss of muscle fibers as seen in uh, myopathy. Phases and turns, they are non-specific abnormalities. They are increased and abnormal in neuropathy as well as myopathy. And they represent increased variability of fiber diameter in uh, myopathy. And in neurogenic conditions, they can be slow conduction in terminal axons, wider end plate zone, or atrophy of muscle fibers when they were denervated. And the instability, which is generally assessed subjectively, although there are quantitative methods as well called jiggle, uh, which allow us to study abnormalities of neuromuscular transmission. So we are ready for question number three. Here is a recording from tibialis anterior muscle. What is your assessment? Here is the signal. Are these normal MUPS recruitment enlarged, short, or is the patient faking weakness? Okay, I'll launch the poll for our audience. Let's see what our audience thinks. A little bit more responses coming. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And here are the results. Excellent. So once again, we have to take a lot of things in consideration when we answer this question. The most important is what muscle is it, tibialis anterior, because the measurements 
do vary among different muscles. Again, based on quantitative analysis, we know some of the small muscles like five, uh, four throttle in Rossius gives us very high amplitude. Triceps gives high amplitude. Biceps tends to give much less amplitude compared to triceps. Tibialis anterior gives high amplitude. Again, this is the information that we know from quantitative analysis. We cannot use a single vision to analyze each and every muscle. So here I can quickly see there are two different motor units. The amplitude over here is 500. This one is about 1500, which sometimes it may look high, but for tibialis anterior, that's quite okay. The waveforms look simple. When I look at the firing pattern, there are two motor units and they are discharging at roughly 10 volts. So this is normal motor unit potentials and normal recruitment. That is on a casual viewing. But if you look very carefully, you will notice that this large potential also has a satellite component over here. This would have been seen very easily. So this, is, this was a tricky question. So my answer is going to be normal MUFs and recruitment, because if you are going to do it quickly, my emphasis over here was on recognize the, recognizing the waveforms and firing rate. But strictly speaking, there is a slight abnormality in this motor unit potential. So that takes us to the analysis of recruitment or EMG interference pattern. Let's look at recruitment. We insert the needle, we ask the patient to give slight force up contraction, we increase the firing rate. Notice you will get more discharges on the top trace, and all of a sudden you get the second waveform appearing on the screen. So this is what is called recruitment. So recruitment, we start with one motor unit, increase the force of contraction, and the second motor unit comes in. In the recruitment analysis, we record always at slight effort. We measure the firing rate and the number of motor units. And it's a relationship between these two phenomena, the firing rate modulation and activation, which makes us recruitment analysis. And it's a quite interesting concept, but also one of the most challenging aspects in our EMG examination. So let's look at calculation of recruitment frequency. You can see this is one second at the top, or 100 milliseconds per division. This is motor unit potential number one, and it is separated in time by roughly 100 milliseconds. Or in the first half, you can see there are five discharges. Uh, so the firing rate is 10 hertz when you get activation of another motor unit. So the firing rate or the recruitment frequency in this instance, it's 10 hertz. Easy concept, but you can see it's not as easy to quantify it. You can, it is also difficult for a patient to just give you a single motor unit and uh, you know, ask him or her to increase the force to get the second. So another approach is to look at the recruitment frequency. You can raster waveforms, you can measure the firing rate. And this is where, once again, you are going to calculate the ratio of the firing rate uh, to the number of motor units. So here the firing rate is roughly 10 hertz, a little less than 10 hertz. It is moving right. And there are three motor units giving us the recruitment ratio of three. So in principle, these are very easy measurements. In practice, they are quite difficult. There is a wonderful publication that just came out on standards for quantitation in EMG in neurography. Uh, published, or this article was developed by Who's Who in EMG. You can see the list of authors over here. And one of the important thing is, once again, you need to do this at at least 10 different areas. Uh, so simple concept, but again, very difficult. Don't make any analysis based on a single epoch. I think you have to see something abnormal three or four times before calling it abnormal. The other approach is we can record the EMG signal to maximum effort. And when we go to maximum effort, there are a couple of measurements that we can do. We look at the fullness of the pattern. You, can, you do not see any baseline. 
You can also measure the so-called envelope amplitude. So you place vertical or uh, rather horizontal cursors and you exclude some of the solitary spikes and you measure the amplitude difference. That's the envelope amplitude. And we can also listen to the sound. And as I indicated, today you are not going to hear the sound uh, so that you can hear me speaking. So these are the subjective assessments. Is the pattern full? How is the amplitude and how is the sound? And this analysis can be very useful, particularly in patients with myopathy. If it's the muscle is weak and wasted and you get a full pattern with low amplitude, that is specific of myopathy. But again, requires patient cooperation and many people cannot give you maximal contraction. So there are other methods of quantitative analysis that can be used even at lower force of contraction. And one such method was developed uh, by Willison by measuring the number of turns. How many times does the signal change its direction? And because you may get small changes in direction because of noise, we put a threshold of 100 microvolts in order to be counted as a turn. So here the amplitude is less than 100 microvolt. We don't consider this turn. So these are the turns. And we can also measure the amplitude between successive turns. And the average value is called the mean amplitude. And Professor Stolberg put all of this thing together to come up with a method which is called turns and amplitude or the TA method. So the principle is very simple. Record sharp PMG signals. Always, always you have to have high quality signals. We record the EMG signals at three to four different levels. At each force level, it is an isometric contraction. So you say, give me slight effort, hold it, you record signal. Give me more, hold it, we record signal. Give me maximum, hold it, we record the signal. So three to four force levels. And once again, we investigate five to seven sites to get 20 recordings. So here is the way the technique works. We make a plot. We have the mean amplitude on the y-axis, number of turns on the x-axis, and we superimpose on it the so-called normal cloud, which is now shown in the red boundary. In a normal subject, most of the data should be inside the boundary. Keep in mind that these boundaries depend upon the muscle, they depend upon the type of needle, they depend upon the gender and age. You can see the data points are inside. So now I move to another site and repeat the procedure. Now, in this particular video, I am kind of starting and stopping recording. That's not a good way. What we typically do is we keep on recording signals. So we ask for a slight contraction, push the record button, motor force, push the record button, push the record button. We don't go start and stop, start and stop. No, uh, actually, we push the start button at the beginning of the program when we start the program. And once we are finished with collecting all the data, then we push the stop button. That's a much easier way for collecting the data. So now let's look at a neurogenic patient. Slight contraction, record. And you can see the data point near the top boundary. Now we go to moderate force of contraction. The data point is still inside, but near the top boundary. And then we go to the maximum force. And now the data point is out. So one data point is outside. As soon as you get more than two data points outside on the same side of the cloud, we can stop the examination. Let's now look at another parameter I would like to uh, report over here. I'm going to discuss this shortly. At maximum force, the activity is 185. I will come back to it in just a few minutes, but that's something I would like you to remember, 185. Let's look at myopathy. Once again, we start at slight contribution. Record, more, record, Almost maximum. And maximum. Okay. 
you can see the different pattern in neurogenic it is on the top left in myopathy it is in the bottom side so this contrasting pattern is very useful to differentiate neuropathy from myopathy using this method and again this can take less than just a minute or two you have to have the normal clouds and they are available for a few muscles if you don't have clouds you can at least look at the pattern this is where you are getting data points so this is more consistent with myopathy now there is another method that uh, i and professor stolberg and professor sanders we worked on it long long time ago and uh, there is an interest coming back into that method this is called experts quantitative interference pattern the idea is why not measure the things that we look for subjectively as i indicated we typically look at how full is the pattern so we have a parameter which is called activity and it measures the time when we get sharp motor unit potential so this is where we have sharp signals this is where we have baseline so we don't measure this time so we add all of this time and that is called activity and this can be expressed as a percentage of the amount of recording epoch or the absolute value but typically when the activity is more than 50 percent the emg interference pattern appears full to all electromyographers we can measure the envelope amplitude just as i indicated before and then we can also measure the number of short segments these are the small amplitude changes that we don't see but we can hear them so here is an example of an equip study we choose the muscle and we had described clouds for the biceps muscle so you can see them pulse amplitude number of small segment and amplitude so this is going to be at slight force of contraction we record and you can see the activity is 110 annual up amplitude we increase the force the pattern becomes more full the activity went up and well up went up and now we go to maximum force and that's a full pattern notice that the activity is 579 out of 100 1000 milliseconds so it's more than 50 percent so full pattern and well up amplitude is about three millivolts another side slight effort moderate effort and maximum effort this is where you have to be careful sometimes you get a full activation of other muscle or a tremor like pattern and you can see there is gap in the baseline and this can generate neurogenic kind of activities like this so these days we actually like to do most of our recordings at slight to moderate effort and we do not like to use maximum force because this can create some abnormal patterns so that's just a cautionary warning here it's again the same thing using a different program we choose the interference pattern and just again as necessary sometimes you may have to go to one millivolt per division and we push the button we get one data point increase the force and you can see how quickly i'm collecting the data point I stay at kind of moderate force and move from one side to another. It, what I find is that usually at slight to moderate effort, you get very high diagnostic sensitivity. So here is another pattern that is of interest. Notice that everything is inside the cloud. This is not abnormal. But when you look at the activity parameter, it is only 207 milliseconds or 20%. That's not a full pattern. So this is the kind of pattern that will occur in a normal subject. Just because of pain, they are not able to give you maximum interference pattern. Or if you had upper motor neuron problem, then you can get data points inside the normal cloud, but the activity is much less. This kind of approach is also used in some of the laryngology studies uh, that, are being, uh, that are currently going on. So in summary, 
you have got quantitative methods that are really fast, powerful, quick, easily available. Normative data is also available for many. Look at this. We've got 17 motor unit potentials. We have got plot of envelope versus activity. I can see the pattern is full normal amplitude. I can see this even though there are no normal clouds. And here is motor unit potential amplitude versus duration at low effort. And this is envelope amplitude and so forth. It's very easy and easily doable. Summary of motor net potentials. Summary of interference pattern. You can quickly see everything is in the normal cloud over here. So we come to the last question and also the last slide. This IP analysis, and again, focus on the clouds and distribution of data points over here. Does this indicate to you normal finding, neuropathy, myopathy, or a central disease? What do you think? Okay, great. I will launch this for our audience again to see. And let's see what our audience thinks. Very well, quick response here. Okay, great. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Here we are. Right. Excellent. So let's again quickly, you have never seen this recording. You have never seen this patient. But just by looking at the data, you were able to give me the correct answer. You can see over here, the activity values are increased. They are outside the normal cloud. We have got multiple points. So this is the direction towards myopathy. We can also see the fullness, it almost reached 50%. Full pattern is typically seen in myopathy. You can also get some sites where the pattern could be slightly mixed. As a result, you can get some data points that are near the upper border, but the general pattern in terms and amplitude is on the lower side and so forth. My point is a picture is worth a thousand words. This is something that took less than 30 seconds but when you present this kind of evidence to the, uh, to the referring physician, you will feel more confident, the physician feels more confident, you have more objective data, and therefore, I think it is better patient care. So in summary, quantitative analysis is the foundation of routine EMG. It is not time consuming. It is very useful to document abnormalities. A picture is worth a thousand words. It reduces subjectivity. Uh, particularly uh, in IP analysis. And therefore, I think it's time we started moving towards using quantitative analysis for routine purposes. So thank you for your attention. You will find information about quantitative analysis at this website, also on other uh, techniques such as single fiber by Professor Stolberg and others. Thank you for your attentions, and I think we will take a few questions. Thank you, Sanjeev. I think we have time for one or two questions. What can I do for having better baseline MUPs? Patients often have problems to activate slightly enough to have two or three. Uh, uh, well, I think that's a matter of learning how to activate the muscle. You have to give proper directions to the patient. Uh, the patient doesn't know exactly what to expect. For example, in biceps, instead of flexion, you know, rotation of the forearm can give you better activation. The second thing that I find is that after a little coaching, the patient knows how much force to give. Once you have that force level, make a recording and move on to the next side. Don't go like, okay, relax. Now activate again, relax. Activate. That's not a good strategy. Once you get a good force level after about say, you know, 30 or 40 seconds, focus on recording, keep moving the needle. Thank you very much. This is kind of a general question. What are the normal values of EMG? As I indicated uh, in my, I think, question number three, it is important to know the muscle. Normal values differ among different uh, muscles. As I indicated, FDI, tibialis anterior, triceps, they tend to have higher amplitude. Professor Stolberg has published a lot of reference values for multimotor net analysis. Uh, they are available in public domain. Uh, 
they have a wonderful publication in muscle and nerve about 30 years ago. I and Paul Barkhouse, we also published some of the normative data. But in, as a general principle, what I think is individual motor net potential amplitude varies about 200 to 2000. Uh, and that's a typical amplitude level that you want to look at. Uh, in terms of duration, it varies from about 5 to 18 milliseconds. That's typically for the limb muscles. Facial muscles are a different thing. Those motor net potentials are much smaller. They also fire much faster. So the short answer is that there is no unique answer. Each muscle is different. All right. Thank you, Sanjeev. We have a few more questions, but we will get them to you all offline. So we will answer a couple other questions here. So again, thank you, Sanjeev, for that great presentation. And this will conclude our webinar for today. I would like to again thank Dr. Sanjeev Nandedkar for his excellent and informative presentation and to you, our audience, for your participation. Please contact us via email, neuro-training.academy at natives.com should you have any questions regarding today's webinar. For access to future events and all other educational programs in Natives, I invite you to join our Neuro Training Academy. The registration is free. Just visit our website or sign up at neuro-training.academy. On behalf of Natives and our Neuro Training Academy, Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again. Thank you.